Hey guys, it's your host, Johnny. And this is Brent. Hey, we wanted to share some huge news with you. The Climb Show Music Business Podcast is now a part of the American Songwriter Podcast Network. That's right. We're super excited to be part of this network along with some other amazing music and music business podcasts. Make sure you check them out on americansongwriter.com forward slash podcast or click the link in the episode notes to listen to some of the best music shows, or the best shows in music. That's right. Hey, Johnny, do your thing. Welcome to the club. This is a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business. Leverage is what you're going to need moving forward. The good news is you don't need anybody's permission to find an audience and build your brand. The bad news is you don't need anybody's permission. You got to do it yourself. And leverage is what it's going to take to get the eye of all the executives, all the industry peeps that you want, that you're going to need to get behind you. You're going to have to get that runway started first. That's why we called it the climb. C-L-I-M-B, creating leverage in the music business. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. That is a Baxter name for my good friend and co-host, Mr. Brent Baxter. Brent's an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady A, Joe Nichols, and more. He also helps songwriters like you, Turn pro by revealing how you can write like a pro, do business like a pro, and then on the regular, he connects you with the pro so you can create a relationship. You can find Brent very easily at songwritingpro.com. Once again, that's songwritingpro.com. And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. They're breaking artists digitally by identifying new fans through data. Yes, it's complicated, but yes, Johnny is smart. If you're an artist looking to increase your streams, blow up your video views, sell more live show tickets, and get discovered by new fans, TV, and music industry pros, then Daredevil Production can help. Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists like Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andrew Griggs, just to name a few. You can find Johnny at Daredevil Production. Production.com. That's production, singular, no S, and there's no S because there is no other. Johnny D. How you doing, brother? Man, I'm I'm doing better than you're talking. If they didn't include the outtakes, we had to have a couple of runs at this thing before we could get going today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it took, we need a little bit longer runway to get this sucker up in the air today. <laughs> exactly. That's for sure. And that, that was all about me weigh, weighing it down. But um, the scary thing is, this is your episode, so you got to do most of the talking. I know, right? God, don't put that on me. Like, listen, if you're waiting on me, you're backing up. Like, that's the deal. <laughs> hey, today we are going to talk about six different ways to build desire. Oh, that is so good because my anniversary is coming up. And uh, anyway. You need some desire? Just... Listen, what you need is a <laughs> pair of uh, underwear from that cat dude, Joe Exotic or something, man. Put on like some animal print. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a tattoo on your chest. Let your hair grow out into a mullet. There we go. And then go in and sort of prance around the living room when the kids ain't looking. I can prance around. I don't know about the mullet thing. My hair's been going the other direction. We just keep cutting it shorter and shorter. So, but uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're, right. Hey, I'm just trying. I'm here to help. I'm That's here right. to help. I'm here okay, to tell you what Okay, for real, what, though, what kind of desire are we talking about? Because this could get uncomfortable real quick. Listen, for anybody to pay attention to your music to want to invest time in you as an artist you're going to have to build desire before you sell anything mm -hmm. and i mean like not just merch and stuff but also you're selling time you're wanting people to spend time streaming you mm -hmm. you're wanting people to buy a ticket you're selling tickets you want people to buy merch you're selling merch before they're going to buy any of that before they're going to do any of that, there has to be a desire factor. This is simple sales. People hate the word sales, mm -hmm. artists especially. But this is what it is. So we're going to talk about how to do that because there's a lot of stuff that is gone wrong, you know, and it feels salesy, right, when, mm -hmm. when it's spammy and stuff like that, when right. people are not building desire but just coming right in with the hard hit. And so we're going to break down six ways that you can – do that and really begin to take ownership of your brand and growing your audience online. Awesome. But before we do that, let's take care of a little business. Just throwing out a lot of love to our friends over at Disc Makers there. We know it's a digital world, but now they're starting to open up the bars, and it is massively important for physical media if you're going to be an independent musician. What's physical media? I mean, it's what it isn't is digital royalty payments, because those are so small that you need the physical media, like CDs, vinyl, and T-shirts to sell at gigs. That becomes a huge 
huge income generator. That's right. You know, speaking of the digital streaming stuff, it takes about 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money that you make selling one CD. Now, we love streams. Go get a bunch of them. I mean, I'm mad at Spotify and some of those places for trying to screw over the songwriter. But, hey, for the artists, go get those streams. But don't leave money on the table by not having merch on the table. It makes sense to have physical merch. And thankfully, our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for disc and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even t-shirts. See, CDs, I don't know how much longer they're going to be around, but the other stuff, USB drives, vinyl, t-shirts, come on, t-shirts not going out of style. And people can't sign a stream. So you can find Disc Makers online at DiscMakers, D-I-S-C Makers.com, or give them a call at 800-468-9353. That's 800-468-9353. Yeah, and you know what? Just side note on this, uh, mm. just personal anecdote. If you haven't bought merch yet and you've got an audience, man, it's time to do it because the first time that we sent Lonely Highway back to Jacksonville, they'd been out of the market for five months. We sent them back and they did two shows, Friday and Saturday night, two different locations. We sent them down there with 166 t shirts. Why is that? Because that was the price break, right? <laughs> and they sold out all the t-shirts because they never had merch before. Mm -hmm. So everybody bought a t-shirt and it was like, I mean, 2,700 bucks, boom, just like that. Nice little add on for the date, huh? Yeah, it was killer. I mean, it was killer. You can't, you just like a lot of people, I think just haven't ever done it. And they think maybe, uh, it's presumptive or something, you know? Yeah. I don't think that's the case. But, hey, join the Climb community if you haven't done so already. We let everybody in, but you do have to ask to be in. That's a place where you can showcase your talent, tell us about your wins, tell us about what gigs you're playing out, ask questions about marketing, songwriting, create relationships with co-writes. It's a great little community in there. We want to see you in there. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the podcast wherever you like to consume your podcast. We are everywhere now. We are nationwide uh, (laughs) on this American Songwriter platform. And tell a friend about it. We had uh, Brett Mm Shiroki interviewed on, actually, we interviewed him, but that's not going to drop until next week. That's right. But, man, I mean, he's been a climber for for a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. I, I love that the pros are in on this, and so he finds value in it. That's the only reason we're ever going to command any time from a guy like that, you know? And you're that same kind of a person if you're listening to my voice right now. So tell somebody, why are you spending that time there? Let them know. Let them know that there's a resource for them. And um, finally, leave a rating and review. We're trying to get to 200. Let's go. That's right. So let's get into it. Let's do it. Six different ways to build desire. You mentioned before that we should just call it six ways to build desire because if they're not different, they're what not are we six doing? Ways. <laughs> they're not three, different. They're three not of six them ways. are the same. <laughs> right. Three of them are the same. <laughs> Listen, in order for any person, and that is you included, to take some kind of action, that action could be to devote your time, even to commit three minutes and 30 seconds of your time, mm-hmm. to go out of your way to do something, to buy a ticket, to buy a t-shirt, to respond to a post or like it post as a person you have to have a reason for doing so and that reason is Mm -hmm. desire this is just like reality psychological reality okay if your desire is to avoid pain and physical harm you might choose to wear a motorcycle helmet Mm -hmm. you might choose to buckle your seatbelt. you might choose that discretion is the better part of valor in a like a hostile verbal confrontation on the verge of escalating to a physical conflict right? Mm -hmm. These are desires. You know, some desires are to avoid fear, right? But it's about desire. If you desire to lose weight, you might join a gym or choose to eat healthier. If your desire is to move to another residence, you might be searching for boxes, purchasing tape, and calling in favors of friends with pickup trucks, right? Mm -hmm. Based on desire. Since you're a musician, a singer, a songwriter, or an artist, your desire is to become better at your craft or to make a living, maybe even creating and performing music. I think that speaks for a large portion of the climbers, not all of them, but a large portion of them. Mm -hmm. And to do that, to make that living, you're going to need an audience of people who desire your music, who desire your musicianship, who desire your songwriting expertise, who desire your singing style. And who desire your live show, right? Mm -hmm. 
It's like a no brainer. Yeah. Duh. <laughs> you know? They got to want it. But how do you build it exactly? And especially how do you build it on a digital platform? Mm-hmm. So let's start off by saying this, that building desire wasn't easy on broadcast platforms like radio. But back in the day before streaming, and that wasn't too long ago. Yeah. Although I have interns right now who have never known a world where there wasn't streaming. Oh, I feel old. Let me get my cane. I know. God, I do too. <sighs> but, you know, the building desire wasn't easy on radio, but consumers had only two choices when they desired to consume music. The choices were you listen to what you owned or you listen to the radio, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And terrestrial radio incessantly pounded a hot new debut single into the minds of consumers until they collapsed into submission and decided to like it. Mm -hmm. So it was... Collapsed into submission. (laughs) Right? That's what it is. I mean... And it was a market by market thing. Like when I say like building desire wasn't easy. Like, remember Sammy Hagar? I told you the story about Sammy Hagar. By the time Sammy Hagar joined Van Halen, he was a multi platinum Ferrari driving, knock down, drag out, straight up rock star. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he wrote the biggest hit for Montrose that they had before he went on a solo career. He had a string of hits, and then it culminated with I Can't Drive 55. That record, which I can't remember the name of right now, but I Can't Drive 55 was on it. It was a huge record. Oh, it yeah. was, I think it was, I think it sold five, six million copies alone. And Not only do I remember Life Before Streaming, I remember that song. Yes. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the strange thing is, obviously this doesn't necessarily matter in the big picture to somebody like Sammy Hagar, but like he never sold any records in St. Louis. It was just a weird market that didn't give a crap about Sammy Hagar. Oh, really? Does Sammy Hagar care? Because no, I'm driving Ferraris. I'm on tour. There's lots of people who love me. We don't necessarily need to cater to St. Louis. But uh-huh. the, the reason I know this is because it was an issue when he joined Van Halen, the first live show that he did with Van Halen was in St. Louis. And he was like, can we do it somewhere else? Like, guys, this isn't good. You know, like I can't sell tickets in St. Louis. They don't care about me. And Eddie was like, dude, you're Van Halen now. We own St. Louis. Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) But it's not necessarily simple. And I also think of Wham. You know, Wham had sold Well, I guess I don't know how many they sold before they came to America, but they were multi, multi multi-platinum in Europe. Mm -hmm. Really, really big, and it was really difficult for them to break into America. It didn't happen until they became one of the first Western bands to tour communist China. Mm -hmm. And that just created all these headlines, and then all of a sudden, we were aware of them, and we cared, and they came over, and then they conquered America. Who's the other one? His first name's Robbie. Robbie's something. He's a huge pop star in Europe. And um, we just could care less about him over here. Well, then I probably don't know. Ah, I forget his name. There's Robbie. like Robbie Williams uh, or... I think it's Robbie Williams. Okay. Yeah. I think that's it. I mean, like he's massive, right? But he is not, not in America. Was he the guy all. that did Blurred Lines? So we did have no. one thing here? That uh, was someone else. Okay. Uh, I think that was someone else. So Building Desire was never easy on broadcast platforms, but it was easier because, you know, if you can get on the radio playlist and you can get into a rotation, people are going to be pounded with your song. And let's remember that while everybody directly or indirectly discovered their most beloved artists who wrote and performed the soundtrack to their lives, this is the soundtrack that you heard that made you want to become a songwriter, that made you want to become an artist and a singer. Nobody... And I repeat, nobody turned on the radio to discover new artists, right? Right. They listened to hear what they desired. And what they desired was their jam, what was familiar to them. So on a digital platform, the consumer gets to choose what they're going to consume, and they're always going to choose the same thing, what they know, what they desire. Mm -hmm. They're consuming it the same as radio, except now they have all the power to listen to what's familiar to them. They get to choose the playlist, and they don't have to take any cues from a program director, so they don't have to be pummeled with new stuff until they're kind of beat into submission. You know, I'd say that with my tongue on my cheek because I, we were beat into submission on some pretty killer songs, you know, <laughs> right, and yeah. some pretty killer music. But I think the analogy still works. I don't want to make it a negative thing. So how the hell do you build desire for an unknown indie artist on a digital platform? We're going to dig into that. So number one, are you ready? Yes. Here we go. 
video footage from live shows, preferably the live shows where the audience was packed. Mm -hmm. As long as the audience is packed, it doesn't matter the size of the crowd. It could be a tiny little thing like the basement here in Nashville where you put 75 people in there and it's wall to wall. That's that's the Viper Room on, on Sunset Strip, too, in mm -hmm. L.A. Same thing, really tiny. Or it can be a show where you're opening up for a national or something and, and you're in front of a couple thousand people. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a festival that you got on. So what you're saying here is show the crowd. Show the crowd and have the footage. Turn the cameras on, dummy. Sorry. <laughs> Turn the cameras on. If you aren't seriously bringing attention if you, you got to find somebody anybody walk around with this camera here's what i need you to do while we're on stage you know if you don't have the time to do that because you're so scattered then you're screwing yourself right mm -hmm. especially on those big gigs when you get them oh yeah right? that one choice gig that you have that's just the bomb you know live footage of you captivating a densely populated audience is social proof to somebody who's seeing you for the first time that you're a compelling audience. It's social proof that you're a compelling artist. Mm -hmm. And the proof is in the video footage. It's right there. Right. You know, live footage of you entertaining an engaged crowd also makes it easier for the brand new consumer and makes it more comfortable for them to take interest in you. Mm -hmm. I think of uh, P.T. Barnum's famous quote, which is P.T. Barnum started Barnum and Bailey Circus. What was the Hugh Jackman movie that was he oh. did? He played P.T. Barnum. It was I think recent. It's greatest show on Earth or something? Was it called the Great? Yeah, Greatest, greatest Show on Earth. So that's all about P.T. Barnum. Greatest that's Showman. Something. Greatest Showman. Yeah, yeah. It's a musical. That's about P.T. Barnum, who started Barnum and Bailey Circus in Delavan, Wisconsin, where I grew up. Really? But nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. That's what he says. Nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. That is a visceral, real, tangible psychological fact that you need to think about. I think a lot of people know this. I'm not telling you something that you don't know, but you don't think about this when you're putting together your posts, when you're thinking about what venue you're going to choose for a live show, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. It absolutely matters what people are doing. This is the ploy for politics right now. No matter what side you're sitting on, the idea is that we're going to try to convince you that this idea is the right idea because so many people are doing it, mm -hmm. you know? Everybody believes this, and they're all up to shenanigans, you know what I mean? Like right. like fake accounts and stuff like that to try to blow up, make something look more big than it really is, mm -hmm. you know, more, more extreme. So my question to you is, are you shooting video? Are you shooting it at all, you know? You better be shooting all your live shows coming up. So I've shot shows for our clients where, I mean, yes, I'm out in the front with a killer camera and a gimbal and I'm in the audience and everything like that. But you know what I also have? I've got like four intelligently placed GoPros that are behind the drum riser, that are on the side of the stage, that are looking directly across the stage so I can, on one half of the camera view, I can see the band, and on the other half of the camera view, I can see the audience, the first few rows of audiences. Mm -hmm. I've also done them where I put a GoPro up on a pipe or something on a ceiling in the back of the venue looking forward. So if we did that with Lonely Highway, I knew it was going to be packed. So I put that up there so you can see the band like way off in the distance, but there's a sea of people in this bar and that, again, it just means there's a party going on here and you're missing something, right? right? Yeah. If you have footage from a decent crowd, let's say, but not like a crazy pack crowd, can you crop out any of the holes? So here's some intention that is all about the editing process, mm -hmm. right? Like, can I just change this and move this over here so it looks like there's a pack crowd? Yeah. So I can crop it a certain way or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, when your shooter has the red light on and the crowd is not packed but engaged, this is a conversation you want to have. Because a lot of you aren't going to have like a videographer or something. It's going to be your sister's dog walker's cousin's boyfriend who lives next door and also, you know, sells you weed or something. I mean, it, you know, <laughs> but he's got the time, yeah. but he doesn't know what he's doing with the camera. So you hand him a GoPro. You've got to communicate with him and give him instructions. Here's one of the instructions that you want to give with them. Find that crowd within the camera. So if the crowd's not packed, but the crowd's engaged, certain angles and certain places that shooter can be can make it look 
brilliant on video, mm -hmm. right? So don't use your eyes and walk around with the camera. Like, use your camera as your eyes. Mm -hmm. So what does the camera see? There's a big hole of people here. If I take four steps over to the left, here's four rows of people. Yeah. Right? And they're all having a good time. That's what we want to do to build desire. Speed changes in editing. Because we're still talking about, you know, video footage from live shows. Mm -hmm. I love, 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 love to play with slow motion and sped up video footage to create emotion and desire when I'm crafting a video ad mm -hmm. for some paid traffic or a straight up music video. I'll give you an example of this. Like Jacob Cade, we've talked before where we took some footage of him. I flew up to Denver and took some footage of him opening up for Steel Panther. Mm-hmm. And we got him that opening slot there, which is a pretty coveted slot. They sold out the forum, 3,600 people. And I was going to go up there and get some footage. Now, they were taking footage. Mom was taking footage with GoPros on either side of the stage, exactly like I told her to. Mm -hmm. So we got some killer footage there. And I was kind of in the back getting the crowd way, you know, f from far away, right? Because it was like a sea. I mean, 3,600 people is a sea of people mm -hmm. in a sold-out venue, right? Yeah. Now, here's a chance where we're sort of optimizing on a golden gig, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm at the venue early. The doors aren't open. And there's a line that is like three blocks long of people waiting to get into the venue. Was, the doors were just about to open up. And this is a general admission venue. It's not seating. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge line. Well, I started from the front of the line with a GoPro on a gimbal and just walked back. And then you speed that up, mm -hmm. and it's an endless line. It just says, wow, this is crazy. I've got my artist on the stage. If you're taking certain shots or you crop it certain ways, which, by the way, we didn't even bother to do, but you could do that, nobody would know that you were even an opener. Yeah. And that's not wrong. I mean, look at uh, back to Sammy Hagar, right? In L.A., he's going to sell out the forum. In St. Louis, mm, he can't so sell much. out enough tickets, yeah. and he's not going to go do a club. Mm -hmm. Because that's not good for the brand, right? Right. In this one particular market. He didn't need that out there in the news. So one of the things, like, if you take that shot that took, I don't know, maybe like a minute, which doesn't sound like a long time, but maybe like a minute to 90 seconds for me to walk. Maybe it was even more for me to walk literally three blocks mm -hmm. to the end of the line. And then I turned around and I came back and the camera's on the whole time. But I sped that up. Right. That looks really, really cool. And there were moments that there's a second show that he did in Spokane, which was a market that was like our number one radio market for him at the time. And he was opening up for a band. I can't remember their name, but they were really, really big there. So that was exciting. Because of the radio play we had there, we probably were responsible for maybe 10 or 15 percent of the butts and seats on that mm -hmm. as a support act which nice. is really cool and he's a showman mm -hmm. so he did this thing where he just like throws his hands up in the air and everybody's hands go up in the air and you know what that's really cool to watch it's even cooler in slow motion <laughs> yeah right you know you got to think like music videos and stuff mm -hmm. like that but we took this footage and that was the footage we used to create the ad, if you remember the story. He had a one-off down in Scottsdale, Arizona, opening up for Dokken. He's never been to Scottsdale, Arizona. He was not on the radio at all in the Phoenix market. We had zero spins. And it, this was a relatively high-priced show. I mean, tickets were 60 bucks to see Dokken, a legacy act from a hair band days. And he was the opener, which means he went on at eight o'clock. The support, the direct support act went on after him. And then the headliner went on. Then Dawkins went on. And we took this footage to put together an ad. And we did a 50 mile radius of the club on the digital ad, spent $200 on the ad buy and 400 people showed up to see my artist at 8 p.m. Yeah, that's great. The club freak. But we did that because we built desire. How do we build desire? Through number one, turn the cameras on. Number two, some different angles and shots. And number three, some choices that we made in editing mm -hmm. that just made it look really cool. And then the other part on that, just a little side note here, is on that particular ad, the tickets were 60 bucks for that show. I don't care how cool my ad is. I'm not going to build enough desire to get a debut artist to stroll in town to town for the first time when he's not on the radio and he's never been to that town before. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to go spend 60 bucks to go see him open a show. Right. 
right? We knew that. So instead of building desire for that, the copy that we put in the ad wasn't salesy. It wasn't like buy your tickets now. It was like, hey, don't miss this. We just assumed you already had tickets to go see the headliner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you you're know, trying so, to build the desire for them to show up early. So they can yeah, see the elsewhere. Yeah, so just come early. Right. But that was a very subtle sort of non aggressive salesy way to kick people in the head like, you know, don't miss Dawkin either, right? But yeah. <laughs> Because you like Doc, and how do I know that? Because I targeted you yes. um, that way on digital. So the same thing with um, Very Alora. The latest video we just released from her, Elevated, that music video, we had a shot where she had some of her crew on one of the last tours. We had a really good crowd on this tour. And you know what? Sometimes in these tours that you go out on these club tours, right, maybe you get an opening slot or you're doing a tour. Man, if you're doing this, you know it's hit and miss. You know, some days you got a really good crowd. Some days it's a little light, Mm -hmm. you know? So here again, I instructed them. I want you to walk from the back of the venue. I wasn't there. I'm just on the phone saying, Hey, if you get a good crowd, walk from the back of the venue behind the crowd and bring it up so I can, you know, see the crowd and then bring it all the way up to the stage. Mm -hmm. And when I described that, I actually meant like, I like to go like through the crowd to do that so you're right up to the front of the stage which is kind of cool and then maybe you know the artist comes right down to the camera and you know grins or points at him or something like that and mm-hmm. it just looks if you speed up the crowd walk until you get to the stage and then you cut it to slow motion it just looks super cool yeah you know <laughs> but in this case her road manager went around the outside of the crowd to the side of the stage but it was still it still really worked because you see the whole crowd there and it just like sped up like right up to the side of the stage and right at that moment she throws her hands up in the air as she's performing and that part again just like i did with jacob k went to slow motion it just made for some super cool footage that looks pro you know Mm -hmm. so think about those things with the video that you're using and i did that video by the way depending on who i have working for me we've used different video editing platforms but in this specific case both the jacob cade ad and the very allura music video i did those in imovie man Hmm. yeah you know they look good so we're not talking about like a supreme amount of knowledge believe me i'm i'm no i don't know how to turn on premiere or final cut pro yeah you know Number two, press. Brent, you know, you've heard of the humble brag. Oh, yeah. Hey, thank you so much for all 80,000 people for coming out to my show. Man, it's so humbling. It's just amazing. You guys are the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kind of do a little twist on that, and I call it the grateful brag. Mm -hmm. Right? So some of you are getting press here and there. When you get the press... If you get some local newspaper press or some press in the local rag, like in, you know, Nashville has the Nashville scene. Maybe they do an article on you or something Mm -hmm. or or some other publication does some kind of article or maybe you get some national press or something like that. You want to post this on your feed, but shout out the publication Mm -hmm. and tag the publication. Yeah. Right. And thank them for making you feel like a rock star with a hashtag grateful. Right. Mm hmm. Include a link to the article when you do this. That should be common sense, but I'm just going down the listicles here. Right. And when you tag the publication, please use accurate tags. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. There's nothing ruder, right, than, you know, imagine somebody going up and accepting an Oscar and giving the wrong director's name. Right. (laughs) What? From some other movie. I mean, that's a backhanded compliment there so sometimes it's difficult to find those tags on certain publications well, and mm-hmm. you want to find them yeah i'll just say uh the strings to mind an example i got an email from chris roggy roggy doggy remember her you i think you yeah. Had yeah so anyway she sent me an email and said oh my word i just let's see i just read this and she forwarded me an email and said uh and see that she want a contest you shouldn't be here is nominated in the top 10 for 2020 texas country music association songwriter contest made my day thank you for your part in helping me become a better writer i was like awesome hey by the way can i use that as a testimonial yes of course you can great screenshot shared on my socials and so she's getting a shout out she sent me that same email and i failed to do it like <laughs> I got to shoot that to my staff to to put it out because they're kind of handling the daredevil uh, socials right now. But I got that same email. And first of all, congratulations, Chris Roggy Fisher. And number two, 
Man, that made me feel really good. Oh, it made me feel great. And also... How, how genius was that? Hey, thank you for your part in this. Yeah, and it was a pri- wow. private email, too. I got permission before I shared it. But she's like, yeah, sure. I'm like, screenshot. And other people will do that for you, too, because it really it makes me look good. And I get to yep. share her win, which makes her feel good and makes the community feel good. And it's a win all the way around. But it wouldn't happen if she hadn't emailed. And I don't expect those emails. Exactly. Well, that's a really good point. So now imagine if she sent that email and she called you Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, oh. You're like, oh, is this for me? Like, I didn't even know. Like, I think maybe she sent the wrong email right, or something, yeah. right? But she didn't because she's really smart. But when you don't take 30 seconds or 20 seconds just to double check every single tag, because a lot of times they're different on Facebook than Instagram than Twitter. You know, make sure that you have all the tags right and be diligent about that. You know, but this is business savvy, you know. Oftentimes, by the way, that we've done this, not for nothing, that artist, because we've been working on their socials, has a bigger social media footprint than the publication. Mm -hmm. So you're really like showing the publication some love who took the time to put you in there. And the size, I mean, you know, to the industry, the size of the publication is going to matter and how important they are. But to your brand new fan, like you're in a magazine. That's cool. Mm -hmm. They don't understand, you know, don't look down your nose at any publication that wants to write something about you and treat them all as if it was Rolling Stone. Yeah. Okay. Because it matters. And it matters too, like for different promo ads I've done for artists, I've taken all the press that they have and just rapid fired through some headlines that just show their name on all these different publications. That's some pretty powerful stuff there. Mm -hmm. You know, that's cool when you do that. So uh, that's number two. Two, number three, interesting slash entertaining videos, either visually fascinating videos of your original material, because, you know, look, your content needs to be either inspirational, educational or entertaining for people to want to consume it, to have the desire to consume it at that level. Mm -hmm. And you singing the biggest hit song in the world that you wrote that's never been cut yet. And being the most awesome singer on the planet is not going to be enough desire for them to listen to it. Right. So what's the desire? Because they don't know who you are. It's not because you suck. It's because they don't know who you are. Yeah. So how do you do that? How do you make that happen? This was, you know, Wham's issue with America. Like, we just didn't know who the hell Wham was. And nobody cared. And nobody was giving them a shot to get a foothold in the press to get the name out there so that we could all freaking discover George Michael, man. Come on. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite, favorite artists of all time. Mm-hmm. But we didn't know. We didn't know. We didn't know. So... If it's going to be original material, then you've really got to put something visually together that's going to be entertaining visually. I think about OK Go mm-hmm. and their video. The so treadmill they kind video, of, yeah. That was the one that started it off, which cost them zero dollars, OK, because they borrowed nine treadmills and made this video. If you haven't seen it yet, it's OK Go, just like it sounds. OK, G-O with an exclamation point. Go check out the video on YouTube, it has like 51 million views right now, okay? It's massive. They just did one shot where they had their whole song and they had this whole choreographed dance on these treadmills that are on and going opposite ways. And it's like, you got to see it. It's it's brilliant. It's super savvy, very resourceful. But people watched that and it became a hit, not because anybody cared about the song or about OK Go, because it was visually entertaining. Mm-hmm. Right. So what can you do for that? And then now they set the bar really high. They came the second one. They came after that. They had a lot more money because they had a lot more attention from that first video. that cost them nothing. These next two videos that they had were much more expensive, but still brilliant. Visually entertaining the printer video where they have like literally a wall of printers that's 10 feet high Mm -hmm. behind them. And when I say printers, I mean like the kind of printer you have on your desk and they're all choreographed printers that are spitting out pages that are printing a piece of a mosaic that creates a whole big picture that the aggregate of the printers create. It's fascinating. And then the other one, they're up in a weightless plane where they're literally Mm. floating free. So it's crazy. But if you're, you know, having a hard time just cooking up some ideas of something that's fascinating visually on your original material, then where does the desire come from? Well, you could do decent videos or cool videos of cover songs and mashups. Mm-hmm. You know, with Very Allura, we did Billy Eilish's Bad Guy and we mashed that up with Seven Nation Army from White Stripes. And I think total she's got on 
I want to say on Instagram and Facebook combined and YouTube. I think she's got over two and a half million views on that video. Wow. That's pretty crazy. People love that. Why? Because I know Billy Alice is a bad guy because at the time we put that out, it was number one. Mm-hmm. And I also know Seven Nation Army. What? Billy Eilish and Seven Nation Army? Let's just see what this looks like. Yeah. It's like clickbait. The desire is clickbait in the mashup, right? Mm-hmm. The second one we did was Lose You to Love Me. And so here's, I'm going to be like really transparent here. This is like a no sale story. Don't be afraid to fail. Be afraid of mediocrity. Mm-hmm. So I had this brilliant idea with Laura and she totally went with it. God bless her. Where I wanted to shoot her like uh, Phil Collins in the Air Tonight video where it's just his face. Yeah. Right up in the camera. And I said, let's do that because Alora can cry on command, right? <laughs> so this song, you know, we mashed up Selena Gomez's Lose You to Love Me, which she wrote about like how she found herself again and started to love herself again after she broke up with Justin Bieber. And she co-wrote that with Julia Michaels, who's probably the number one hit songwriter on the planet right now. And we mashed that up with Issues, which is a big hit for Julia Michaels, who's also an artist. Mm-hmm. And it worked like really, really well. But I had to do it with a green screen because I wanted her to be just stoic and singing and then we we're going to do this, make all this action happen behind her. And this is where I learned, Brent, everything you got to do not to screw up a green screen shoot. Because <laughs> he screwed it up big time. And I didn't know any better. So we had to do some workarounds. And that video didn't do as well, but it's a great mashup. But, you know, you do enough of these and you start to get good at them. Mm-hmm. So number four, jab, 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 right hook. We know this from Gary Vaynerchuk. When you have a business where you're selling a product that has a deep-rooted fundamental value or a service that people know, they know what it is, they know what it does, and they know what it means to them, and you're going to be on digital trying to sell that, you have to give and give again and give again and then ask for a call to action. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, download this free PDF so that you can drip on them and get to create a relationship with them. So it's easier to do this with a product that has a fundamental value. It's harder to do this when it's art, because if you're selling art, there is no value to it until enough people desire it. But the same tenets, the same principles matter. You can't just try to sell a Mm t-shirt. You can't just go try to get them to download your song or try to get them to stream your song. You're going to have to give them some kind of content first and continue to do that before they're going to let you in. You know, how are you going to make, make a relationship with them first? You have to love them first. This is a one-to-one situation. Mm-hmm. Okay? Number five, touring and live shows. How do you look live? How does this matter digitally? It matters digitally. Okay? It all works together. But we're going to start playing out again. How do you look live? Mm-hmm. What is the perception that I would have as a new consumer coming to your live show, mm-hmm. right? Like, let's just say it's in a bar. I'm going to go to this bar because I'm in town to visit my friend and this is her favorite haunt. And so we're going to go to that haunt. I'm not going to see you. Right. I'm there with my friends. I'm going to drink. Yeah. But what does that live show look like? Where's the desire there? Mm-hmm. Right. You need to intentionally construct the vibe of your live show. You know, are you using subpar or crappy production? Are you using the bars subpar or crappy production? Mm -hmm. You know, if the venue is providing the production, is it adequate? If not, what can you do to add to it? Mm -hmm. Right. What can you bring to deliver killer professional sound and lights along with what better be a killer live performance? As an artist, there's many times where we've rented additional PA gear to go into a venue to ensure that we sounded amazing, Mm -hmm. right? I don't want to sound like every other band that was in there. I want to blow your mind. Yeah. Uh, A lot of times those club venues are lacking low end. You know, you bring in a couple subs and the power and the crossovers and you, you can do some amazing things. So what can you bring to do that? If it's a really big show, if it's like that show where, like for Jacob Cade, where he's opening up for Steel Panther, he's gonna be in front of 3,600 people. You know, come off the cash and rent a really pro front of house guy. Yeah. Who's the best front of house guy in your market right now? If you can't answer that question, you're not thinking about this right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got three people on my list that I can call who will make any one of my artists sound like gods. Mm -hmm. 
okay? And it matters in a big way. Maybe you can't afford to take them out on tour, but if it's a big show, like an opener kind of a thing or something, man, you better do it. Let's talk about the size of the venue. Intentionally create that vibe. You know, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd, and you're going to remember the crowd. So I think about Greta Van Fleet, who got a boatload of press because they sound just like Led Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. And they had a big, big, big buzz, and they went out on their first tour, and they could have easily, easily made way more money on that first tour if they played 600 seaters and sold... 400 tickets Mm -hmm. but instead they chose like 150 to 300 seaters and they sold everyone out because that's a whole nother story right so that means they made less money on paper your accountant's not going to like what that looks like right okay but where's the desire here's the desire velvet rope man there was just as many people talking about how they couldn't get in to see the show as there were that got in to see the show (laughs) right and you know next time they come to your town oh how quickly do you think those are going to sell out? I don't want to miss out. Right. Fear of loss. Fear of missing out. When they play the bigger venue now, now when they're getting the 600-seater, better chance to sell them that one there out. There you go. Pick the smallest venue, okay, that you have in your town where you can sound good. And I'll tell you what. Like, this is a matter of ingenuity. Like, the basement is tiny, tiny, tiny. I have heard some bands go on there on that stage, and they sound absolutely crappy. Mm-hmm. And they sound like a typical, like, ho-hum bar band is not interested. And then I've heard, like, I saw Her, the band Her, uh-huh. on there. Like, they used to be on Warner, and they let, like, they sounded like a freaking stadium act <laughs> in the basement. Yeah. It was phenomenal, man. Like, it was just a mind-blowing. And I saw it in the basement. I could have spit on them <laughs> from the back of the room. Yeah. You know? So pick that small venue, work that small venue, keep that going until... You can sell it out multiple times, and then you bump up to the next venue mm-hmm. because it's a better vibe. I mean, you know, a hundred people in a venue that has a capacity of of seventy five is a really really good time. A hundred people in a venue that has a capacity of five hundred is a bummer. Yeah. Same show, same crowd. Sometimes the story you want to tell is, "Hey, I'm playing the bigger room. We booked the so and so, which has a." 400 seat capacity, whatever. And then you want that to be the story. What you're saying is pick a different story. Pick the story of we sold out whatever the place is. Exactly. What are the optics here? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the optics? Like, are you paying attention to that? Next is, and we'll wrap this up here because I got one more that we'll fire through really quick. But don't oversaturate the market. What's the word I'm looking for is the amount of frequency in your market. Okay, what's the frequency you are in your market? Don't oversaturate the market unless it's the right show. Okay, now what do I mean by that? Well, oversaturating the market, if you're doing a big show where you're bringing in some extra PA and you're going to pack in a place of 150 or 200 people and you do that, let's say, maybe three times a year at the most, Mm -hmm. okay, that's going to become an event and that's going to build desire because it's infrequent. If Adele's playing down the street every Saturday night, you can go see her next Saturday. Yeah. Right? There's no fear of loss. There's no need. There's no fear of loss. Yeah, it's like, well, let's catch the next one. That's right. That's absolutely right. If football, the, you know, if the Titans played every weekend all year round, nobody would care. I mean, it would just be like, oh, all right, well, yeah, maybe I'll catch this one. But like, there are only so many games, and the season's over, and you have to wait till next season. How much pent up demand is there for, my goodness, any sports right now? Yeah, yeah, we don't exactly, have it. exactly. It's, Think about that. It's so a thing of scarcity. With, with Lonely Highway, this was a band that had a pretty decent following in the Jacksonville market, which is a huge market, by the way. Jacksonville is a big freaking city, mm-hmm. okay? So you can go play, like, you know, on the beach, and you're going to get a certain market, and then you can play 20 miles west of Jacksonville, and it's a totally different market. It's that kind of reach, right? Mm-hmm. They had a pretty solid draw, I think, of maybe about 100 people to 150 people, depending on the night. And they played every weekend for years. Okay? Yeah. We took them out of the market, brought them up to Nashville. They were out for five months. They went back, and I tripled their money just because they were out of the market. Right. And so the vibe is different down there. So the desire is different down there. They were normally making twelve hundred bucks on their hometown gig with the hometown bar where they grew up in Baker County. Twelve hundred bucks a night for three hours. And then they would go and play this other place was like six hundred bucks a night. That was like two hours south of Jacksonville and Crescent City. Mm -hmm. So I went in. They hadn't been back there in five months. 
and this is just a matter of get, getting them what they're worth too. Yeah. But I said, you know, we got to guarantee a two grand at the place that they got six hundred dollars a night from, and at their hometown bar, I got to guarantee a twenty five hundred dollars. And the club owner's like, well, how am I going to do that? Five bucks a head. I said, charge ten. And she did, and we sold it out. They turned away <laughs> 80 people that night. Yeah. You know? So it is about building desire, but if you're doing it too much, right? If you're giving the milk away for free, nobody's going to want to buy the cow, right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but what do I mean by the right show? So I tried to do this with uh, Jacob Cade as well. But if you have shows that you can have like every weekend or more, let's say more frequently than three times a year where you're doing a big festival or an opening gig for a national act – that can be as frequent as you want to be because that's not your draw, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But you're being associated with a bigger act, you know? And you increase your marquee value when you are being associated with – because every national act that's going to come through is going to have killer production, killer lights, and you're going to be seen with them so you get – to be famous through association, right? Yeah, and, you're, and, and it's a chance to get in front of new eyeballs, new ears. That's right. In a moment where they're coming there and they are excited and they spent money to go see this headliner and they are prepared to have a good time. Mm-hmm. And they are there to see a show as opposed to just hang out in the bar drinking because that's our watering hole and you happen to be playing, right? And the last one of this, and then, I'll, and then I'll wrap it up with the sixth one here, but throw in a killer cover or two at these opening shows that you have. Mm-hmm. You know, if you got a 30 minute set and you're trying to shove your music down, everybody, man, what if you did like not a mashup, but like a little um, like a little medley of, of two cover songs that are badass that you can slay. And so you sort of squeeze that into the slot of one song's time amount of time. Mm-hmm. Right. Tom Jackson says that every artist gets that big gig, one big show where they get to show themselves and they think, wow, we've got a half hour set. How many songs can we squeeze into a half hour? Mm -hmm. Wrong approach. He's like, make the moments happen. You know, how good of a show can you put on with four songs instead of six? And that is going to build the desire. And so we I saw this with Jacob K when he opened up for Winger. Mm Up in Denver, 750 people there. And he's killer. He's great. He's out there crushing it. He does like three of his own songs. People are digging it. And then he busts into a, not a mashup, but a little collage of Rocky Mountain Way and Stranglehold. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people went bananas. <laughs> Like, that's when they fell in love with them, right? And then he finishes with his own song, and it was killer. They remembered him, you know, because of that. So building desire, you got to give them a little bit of what they want. By the way, that's an issue that happens with artists like Garth Brooks. Mm -hmm. The the real smart ones know I'm not going to do a new record and come out and make you pay $300 to come see me, and you're not going to hear, you know, you're not going to hear... Yeah, you're not going to hear that because I want you to hear this new stuff because right. this is this is what's relevant. No, no, no. no. They want to hear the hits, man. Mm-hmm. So play a couple hits in there. Play one or two of them. Don't be afraid. So finally, last one, then we'll wrap this up. I know we're going long. After the show, hang around the merch table after every single show. Mm-hmm. Don't be demure about this. So many artists are demure about this. They feel like it's obnoxious or braggadocious to assume that people are going to want to come over to the merch table afterwards. Yeah. So they feel afraid of being vulnerable about putting themselves out there. But you're screwing yourself. I don't care if it's if you got a crowd of 800 people because you opened up for some act and, you know, 10 people come over. Those are 10 people that live in your market Mm -hmm. who freaked and are about to buy something and want to get an autograph. And that's 10 more people that will be at your next headlining show. Yeah. You got to do this one at a time. So you have to tell them from the stage when you are the most famous person in the room. That you're going to be over by the merch table. If you'd like to get to know us, we'd love to get to know you. We'll be right over here by the merch table immediately following the show. And then you go over and you do it and you hang out and you talk and you take pictures and you make friends. And you're building desire through relationships. Yeah. You know? Well, that's all I got to say about that. I think people need to break this down, unpack this, and really be intentional about this. You don't just walk up on stage, sling a guitar, and start blowing people's minds. It's more. It's more nuanced than that. And that's the difference between an amateur and a pro. Yeah, and you know? one thing I pulled from this, too, is that you're not just a music business. You're a media company. Yeah. You're a media company. And it's we just need to face that. Well said. I stole it from Gary Vee. Well said. Yeah, own it. Because, listen, th- this is the reality of it. <laughs> 
You don't have to be aware of it. You don't have to believe it, and you don't have to like it. But it is the reality. Yep. Okay? So with that, guys, hey, join the Climb community if you haven't done so. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you consume podcasts. Tell a friend about it because you love it. And take 30 seconds to leave a rating review. Get us up to 200. If you haven't gotten the free download yet, my informational PDF, 21 Biggest Reasons You Don't Have More Fans and How to Fix It, go to giftfromjohnny.com and just tell us where to send it. It's J-O-H-N-N-Y, giftfromjohnny.com. Tell us where to send it. It's free for just playing our home game. And it's going to get your head right, get you straight, and get you thinking in the right way about a digital platform versus a broadcast platform. And we're available for consultation, guys. Okay, I, At this moment, uh, it's going to come to an end here soon, but I still have the COVID discount going on mm-hmm. at Daredevil. So it's a discount on the consultation, but just email us at info at daredevilproduction.com. Put consultation in the subject line, and we'll get back in touch with you and get something on the books. Sometimes some one-on-one like this with this kind of stuff strategy and and this kind of oversight is all that you need to snap it into another gear and get going so that's the end of that guys this podcast exists because we want you to win so keep on climbing and we'll see you at the top